Hello and welcome to my retro watches. This episode is a Seiko with a story. That's right, I've got a Seiko and it's got a great story to tell. Before I tell the story, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the owner of the watch. The guy's name is Ken Smythe. He's a British guy and he contacted me because he had a Seiko that he needed fixing. It was his friend's and his friend's had sadly uh, passed away and he wanted the watch to remember him by. So of course, I obliged and said, yeah, of course, Ken, send me the watch. I'll fix that for you, no problem at all. And in doing so, we ended up on a, a telephone call and Ken said, I've got this other Seiko. And I bought it back in 1970 or 71 when I was in the army and it's got a great story. So he told me the story and I thought it was fantastic. So I said, Ken, send me the watch. I'm gonna bring it to YouTube. I'll uh, tell my audience all about this. And of course, we'll do a service video on it and see how well we can get it running at the end. So of course, I'm now going to tell you the story. Okay, back in 1968, which was four years before I was born, Ken was a young man and he joined the British Army. And more importantly, he joined the Royal Artillery Regiment. And he was first uh, sent to a place called Devizes, which is in the UK in Wiltshire, uh, before being sent to Cyprus, where he did a stint there. And then he was posted to what would have been West Germany at the time. And in West Germany, he was stationed with the uh, mobile uh, artillery unit. And they consisted of some big guns uh, called M109 howlers. Now these things, to the untrained eye, look like a tank, because that's what I thought they were. And here's a picture of one that Ken sent me now. And of course you look at it, and because I don't know anything about military, I said, oh, that's a tank. But of course, Ken's told me, whatever you do, don't tell anybody it's a tank because it's not, and people will know, or people in the know will know, and they'll correct you. Uh, and this is a mobile artillery unit, so this was just basically artillery that was mobile, that they could park up and uh, fire. And these things had, I think, it was something like 18 kilometer range, correct me if I'm wrong, and they had an accuracy of about half a meter. So that is absolutely, truly impressive. And the shells, I think, were 155 mil. Uh, in diameter so big stuff indeed very very impressive now Ken he didn't uh, uh, work on the guns themselves he was a regimental surveyor so he would be out in the field uh, surveying I presume the land uh, where you would station these things and I guess where also you'd be uh, firing them as well a very very important job and of course this was all before the days of GPS so everything would have had to have been mapped so you know impressive skills what a, an amazing uh, job to have had. Now, one day Ken was walking past one of these uh, guns and his friend called Yorkie, he was the driver of one of them. And he had his hands in the engine because there was something wrong. Now, normally they would have been fixed uh, by the uh, another department who would come and fix the, the issues, but apparently the issue was relatively straightforward, just needed sort of more hands than just two. So Ken obliged and the pair of them had their hands in this, it's an enclosed engine apparently. The engine is a V12 Detroit diesel engine and I can only imagine that is one heck of a beast of an engine to uh, drive one of these things because they must weigh a lot. So anyway, they were there they were. Uh, this was 1974 he thinks. Hands in the, um, the engine bay trying to mess around, fix the problems and Ken got his arm stuck and after a while of wriggling and writhing, he managed to get his arm out. And sadly, when he pulled out his arm, it was missing his beloved Seiko 5. Now, he'd only bought the Seiko 5 probably two to three years previously with his army salary. And, uh, you know, he told me he'd really loved that watch. It was his favourite watch he'd ever owned. And he was pretty uh, peed off that uh, this thing was now in the bottom of this uh, tank. Uh, not tank. See? I'm saying it again. <laughs> so... Anyway, he, him and Yorkie uh, spent a good three hours, he reckons, looking for his watch. Uh, they didn't want to leave it in there, of course, and they were under it, and they opened the sump plugs to try and get in the bottom, fish it out, but they just couldn't find it no matter what they did. So unfortunately, uh, they had to close the engine back up, and that was that. Uh, Ken had lost his watch, and the, uh, the engine had gained one. Uh, so, pretty distraught. I guess Ken must have been really peed off, and. Uh, you know, just went down as one of those. But 
the story didn't end there because about nine, he thinks about nine months to a year later, there was a problem with that very same engine and the whole engine had to be removed from the unit. And Yorkie just happened to be there, of course, because he was the driver of that, uh, that vehicle. And as they were taking the engine out, lo and behold, in all of the uh, oil, dirt and grime and crud at the bottom, there was Ken's watch. And he fished it out. And of course, it was covered in all this crap. You could hardly see it. But he washed it in petrol, of all things, and uh, looked at the watch. And lo and behold, the watch was, first of all, OK. And more importantly, it was still running. Now, the rumour is that it was actually still not too far out on time either. And he puts that down, actually, to the fact that these engines uh, cause a lot of vibrations. And, of course, the artillery units are generally on the move every day. So these things were always... Uh, moving around and I guess it is possible that the uh, the, um, the motion of the vehicle and the vibrations of the engine and such like could in theory turn the rotor enough to give it just enough power and to keep it going. But either way, what a story. The fact that this very Seiko uh, has survived inside an engine like that. I mean, it'd make a great strap line, wouldn't it? You know, Seiko's built like a tank because they can survive in one. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, I'm a great big uh, Seiko fanboy. I think many of you know that. I did a video a while ago. It's, 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 a, it's not really a proper video, but I did a video called My Rat Watch, and that was an absolutely totaled Seiko. It was wrecked in every sense of the word, and um, I thought for a challenge, let's take it apart and see if we can get it going again, and I did. And it was more just to see just how far you can take these things and for them still to be able to work and keep time. And I think this is almost another example. The uh, the one thing you can say is I guess what it had in its favour is that back then it was still relatively new. So the gaskets were still been uh, doing their job correctly. Certainly the, the case back gasket and the crown gasket. So that must have stopped the ingress of all of that uh, horrible uh, engine oil and uh, grease and dirt that uh, sits in these things and it didn't permeate into the movement. So how about that? So look, this watch is from August uh, 1970. That's when it dates from, according to the code on the back. We are now in August 2020. This watch is 50 years old to the month. Now that's a bit eerie in itself, isn't it? So I plan to, as always, put it on the bench. We'll take it apart. We'll clean it. We'll reassemble it and see how good we can get it running. Now it is running at the moment, uh, but I've not really had a chance to look at it any more than that. Ken doesn't know if it's had any work on it. He can't really remember. Obviously, 40 years of history is a long time. He knows he's had a crystal. He might have had a, a more than one crystal, and um, but he can't remember actually having it serviced. So we'll have to find that out and um, take it apart. So stay tuned, guys. Possibly this is going to be another long video like most of ours. Mine have been recently, so... I hope you enjoy it. It is a Seiko 6119. I have covered these on the channel before, but I think just because of the story, it's worth doing it just again. So we'll now go onto the bench. I'll stop talking and we can start taking the watch apart. Okay, here we go. It's your first proper glimpse at the watch after me rabbiting for so long. And as you can see, there is some damage to the dial, a bit of patina. And to me, that's uh, moisture that's got underneath the uh, lacquer. Now, um, speaking to Ken about this, he doesn't seem to think that that was like that when it came out of the uh, tank. But he doesn't know how it happened either. Um, so who knows? Um, but maybe we'll find out some clues as we open it up. Now, um, as I say, I've not done anything with this yet. Uh, so we'll take the back off and have a look inside. Now I have loosened it so I can just use my fingers he says there we go and the first glance is it looks like a normal Seiko 6119 no surprises looks quite clean actually uh, not much where where you would normally see it with the rotor sometimes the rotor rubs around here a bit and that looks pretty good to be honest uh, so let's put it on the time grapher and see what sort of readings we get 
Okay, so let's just start the machine up. Obviously there's the movement. And let's see what sort of trace we're gonna get. There we go. Well, to be honest, first glance, that doesn't look too bad actually. The lines look fairly uh, parallel. There's a little bit of noise, but that could be just me uh, in the background. The uh, amplitude is quite low and the beat error is way off. Now my understanding, certainly from speaking to uh, a professional I know, is that uh, beat error generally doesn't change. It'll only change if uh, it's been worked on. Uh, so there is a good chance perhaps that the regulator or the uh, stud have been nudged at some point. But anyway, this is what we've got to improve. Uh, so let's take it apart and see what we can improve. So as per usual for me, here we are on the microscope. I thought I'd do a scope before we uh, take it apart. Just have a quick look. And um, okay, we're looking at the balance there. Obviously it's beating away quite nicely. But what I can see is sort of dirt, congealed oil there, certainly in that jewel. Uh, the balance jewel does look quite dirty as well. Typical of old oil. Um, now, what I'm looking for here as well is looking at screws. So like this one, looking for indications that it's been taken apart. And that screw does look like it's been um, played with at some point. Some of them look very clean, but even to that said, yeah, there's definitely, uh, definitely somebody's been in here. I'll see if I can point out. So if you look at the outer edge there and the edge there, if you're turning the screw, Obviously you're pushing power or force that way and that way, and that's what you're getting. So Ken, you might not remember, but this has definitely been worked on at some point. But nevertheless, that doesn't matter. It's a shame really, I'd love to have seen it full of absolute oil and be able to fix it that way. Uh, but that would be much more entertaining for us all. However, I'm not gonna be put off. As I say, let's take it apart. I know this movement like the back of my hand. Um, so it's not gonna to take too long at all to pull it to bits. Okay, so let's get taken it apart. Okay, we'll start off with the calendar works and uh, take those off and then we'll turn our attention to the movement itself. Uh, so first of all, we have the usual Seiko uh, C-clip and uh, I just like to prise this very gently just to start getting it up. If you prise this too much, it does that where it jumps. Uh, luckily, I can find it easily enough and then we can remove safely the day disc. And actually, well, we know it's a 1970, but I can also tell that this is an early uh, Seiko 6119. 6119 is one of my favorite movements. This is the C version according to the movement itself, but you've got metal parts. This is normally in the later ones made of plastic. Uh, so to see, the, this is the uh, the date wheel. Is it, no, the, the, yeah, the date wheel finger. So that's what changes the date over. And um, it's usually made out of nylon. So to steel, see the steel one is uh, good to see. So we'll first of all remove the uh, retaining cover. And we have four screws to do so. And that was a little bit of a disaster. Screwdriver slipped a little bit and moved a few of the parts out of the way. So we have 
the day ring, the date ring, which normally has a little click lever, and that's the one that's danced across the, the other side of my bench. So I need to go and find that. And here is said spring, didn't go too far, it normally sits there. And to be fair, they, they should jump out, but they normally don't jump out for me. Uh, so today is an exception. And of course, we've got all the train uh, motion works here. Uh, but I'm going to turn my attention, first of all, to the keyless. Apart from this little jump-in lever here, which is for the quick set on the day wheel. So we'll remove the set-in lever spring. Two screws. And then we have the yoke and the setting lever itself, which just levers out like so. Sometimes they actually get rusted in, certainly if you've had any water ingress uh, through the crown. Uh, so then we can pull the crown and stem out, uh, remove the clutch. He says remove the clutch. I can't uh, get hold of it with my tweezers from this angle. There we go. Okay, now the uh, the train itself. So the, the hour wheel will just lift off if that's in the right position. The intermediate wheel here, it's unusual. It looks like a brass colored one. I've never seen that color. They've, I've seen, again, these are normally in nylon plastic uh, i have seen steel ones but i've never seen one in that color and i've done a lot of these watches so that's actually quite interesting for me uh, then we need to remove well here we go is another telltale sign so here we have this this cover plate holds hold the uh, minute wheel in and it has a screw here and it has a very small screw that goes there that screw is missing so somebody's been in here and um, from my perspective, it's annoying because, okay, if it was a hobbyist, fine. Um, but if it's a professional and they've lost a screw and they've just not bothered to put it back in again, well, that's just cheating, isn't it? So that's not really, that's really not really nice. Uh, fortunately, I will have a spare in one of my donors. I'll just have to find it. So we can remove the cover. We have the um, minute wheel to come out if I can find some body coat. The uh, little transmission wheel or drive wheel. And then we can remove the date fingers. And that is in a little bit tighter than I would expect. There we go. Little nylon uh, part and then a metal part too. And we're nearly done on calendar side. Uh, so we have this spring here, which is all part of the quick set mechanism. And first of all, we need to remove, I'll take the tension off it, sorry. So I'm gonna pull that out. And just release it that way. And it's held in by a screw over here. Just lift out quite easily. Can and pinion. I like to grip it and pull it. That is the uh, calendar side already uh, disassembled. Now uh, we have the shock jaw for the balance, and then we have these things called diafixes 
I've done a whole video on these. These are something I won't be touching in this video. I will be cleaning them and oiling them, don't get me wrong, but they're an absolute git to fit and quite time consuming. So for the time being, I'm gonna leave that in. I will eventually remove this as part of my cleaning procedure. So we'll flip it over now, we'll do the other side. Okay, so normally I'm gonna remove the balance first, but I've just noticed that I took the dial off and I did not screw the dial feet back in. Not the dial feet, sorry, the dial screws. There's one here and there's one here. Now, if you don't uh, screw them back in and you put it for a watch cleaning machine like I've got, or you put it for an ultrasonic, they have a tendency to fall out. And if they fall out, one, they're hard to find, two, they're really hard to fit. So good practice is to screw them right back in. Now, obviously, oh, am I on camera? Uh, I do this holding my fingers. I shouldn't really be doing that, but as I'm gonna clean everything, I don't think it's too uh, important. Fingerprints right now. So we'll put that back into the holder. And of course, because the balance is an important component of a watch, let's get it out of the way, and keep it safe. that not doing very well here are we so that see that the screw has fell on to the balance and stopped it so that was not an impressive move at all now i'm just trying to gently i'm going to see if i can get it but i'd rather move the balance out but it's not going to come so it's already turning into a bit of a disaster at this point. I can see the screw and it is holding everything up. There we go. And now that will lift out. Certainly a bit of a heart and mouth um, episode. Right, on with the next part. So this is the automatic uh, framework, they call it. Uh, it's the bit that houses all of the, uh, the winding mechanism on a Seiko. Three screws. Another one that's in really tight. To be honest, this screw doesn't look right to me. It's a flat top. Now you probably can't see that in camera. It's very flat and they are normally just slightly rounded. So again, suspicions that whoever has looked at this has not been as competent so you would like to think they are. Now, uh, in taking this off, you have the magic fingers or the pull levers, and sometimes they do like to jump. There we are. We'll remove that as well. It's uh, two screws there to remove all that but for the time being I'll just take that to one side and we'll press on with the rest of the works. Now this is quite interesting we've taken the cover off and already I can see lots of strange I'd call it strange dirt that. Let's just go back to here. Me personally I wouldn't expect to see sort of dirt around here it's like oil or something's flowed perhaps through here. Definitely, definitely strange. Um, however, we're going to clean it, so let's not dwell on it too much. So I want to let down any uh, power that is in the mainspring, and this doesn't always come off on camera, but I have to 
wind the spring a little bit, grab hold of the click and then let it down with the screwdriver. I'm just trying to angle that so you might be able to see it. So there's quite a bit of power in there. But then once you've done that, we can unscrew. The ratchet wheel, the screws are dancing for me today, absolutely running away. Take the ratchet wheel off. And again, well that's a bit of wear and a bit of dirt. Now we can remove the train wheel bridge. You can see here the uh, other die shock uh, for the escape and the center jewel and the third wheel jewel. So this is held in by three screws of which this screw that I'm screwing undoing now seem to be uh, not even finger tight. Likewise with that one. That one's got a bit more bite. So the bridge, I mean, I've never known really how tight you should go with uh, screws, uh, but I tend to tighten them finger tight and then just give them a little bit of a nudge more. I don't think that you need to put a maximum power into a screw that you can't move it at all, uh, because you do run the risk of tightening things too much at that point. But equally too loose, there's a good chance plates like this will start to move and you don't want that. So train wheel bridge is off. Again, bit of dirt. And now we can see the inner workings. So we'll remove the train. Or those, the first two should I say. The click itself is just held in by a screw. Can be sometimes, for me anyway, awkward thing to refit this. Sometimes you do it straight away, other times it refuses to sit there properly. And I'm just trying to keep that screw separate because it's normally just a bit shorter than the rest. Now we can take the barrel out. I'll just put that to one side for now. Uh, then we just got the uh, center wheel bridge that has a flat screw. It's the only flat uh, screw that you would see in one of these movements. Sometimes when you get to this point you see the round and once again for me that's a telltale sign that somebody has put it back and not used the correct screw. There we go, bridge is off. I can remove the escape. Uh, then it's just a case of taking the pallet cock off. Again, one of the, both of these screws here. I know you can just probably see the back of my hand, but not tight at all. Um, so Again, for me personally, and I'm not a pro, I'm just a complete hobbyist in every shape and form. Even I'm surprised that um, these so many screws are so loose. And we'll try and get the, there we go. Sometimes you have to be a little bit careful trying to get the pallet out. Uh, the uh, pinion at the bottom can snap. Sometimes they do get stuck. So if you pull on them too much or you pull on them and they're not straight, you do run the risk of snapping that off. So there we go, we just take the uh, centre wheel out and job is a good one. The movement is disassembled. I'll quickly put that on the um, microscope, we'll have a quick look and see how clean or dirty that is. Uh, then I'll open the barrel actually, we'll have a quick look inside the barrel before we go to cleaning. Right, so here we are on the uh, main plate and as you can see we have quite a bit of dirt around the jewels as expected there's a hair there and I don't think it's mine uh, there's I don't even, don't even want to know what that might be and again around the 
barrel well that's interesting isn't it is is that what I'm looking at now I need to use the other viewfinder is that wet grease it is look see it's just starting to go off so that's interesting trying to date when this may have been serviced well there's definitely one way to tell isn't there let's find the case back uh, so I'll have a look at that in just a moment but there we go we've seen that side let's just quickly flip it over and have a look at the other for the sake of it I expected around the keyless to see grease and grime a jewel doesn't look too bad dire shock inside there well I can see some gunk uh, that actually doesn't look too bad at all so yeah typical of a watch of this age I think so looking in the case back and I don't know whether this is going to come across on camera but there are definitely some service marks um, it really is hard for me to see um, here we go so I mean I don't normally make sense of um, service marks as in what's actually there certainly if somebody out there can enlighten me that'd be great but these do look like dates uh, which is unusual but 90 and then 91 uh, I can't make that out for, with my eyesight from here but clearly either a year or just a few months apart so maybe it went in for something and then it wasn't fit, fixed properly so it went back and then there's another scribble over this side and again that doesn't indicate a date to me maybe it does to you guys if it's coming through clear so and also more importantly as well the gasket is missing so that's quite disappointing actually again why would you do something and then not either replace the gasket or at least keep the old one there uh, the case back gasket is the most important sealant you know without that despite how tight you might do it uh, moisture from either your body or the outside air will get in and again that could be so ken for you that could be the reason why your dial is peeling the way it is could be just purely that whoever's been in here perhaps it was in 1990 and that was the last time it was done um, they didn't bother to put the seal back on disappointing uh, for Seiko fans out there what's quite interesting it's 1970 and it's water resistant the water resistant came in I think in 1970 it was a 69 was a proof but I think I've got a, a 1970 somewhere as said waterproof uh, for collectors people like us we like the waterproofs um, it's a they call it the proof watch and that's all it means it's not water resistant it says waterproof which is a bit cooler so there's a bit of trivia uh, lastly I've opened the barrel and let's just see if I can get that focusing the barrel uh, the mainspring definitely needs a good clean uh, the old oil in there has turned into a black sort of coagulated uh, consistency so we'll take that out and I'll service that separately but there we go guys that is the disassembly of this movement and what I'd like to do now is what I've been doing in my last two videos and that is a little funny montage of the cleaning machine. Um, it's a new feature that I've been doing. It's a bit of fun. I like filming it. If you guys think that that's a, a funny fun part to put in the channel, please give me the comments below. I'd like to know whether you are enjoying that bit or whether you find it annoying. For me, it's a case of being, you guys being able to take a break, really, because my videos are so long that perhaps at that point you can go and get yourself a cup of tea or a beer or whatever you want. So let's go to that now.
Okay, welcome back after that uh, little musical interlude there. Uh, please don't forget to leave a comment if you think I should keep that feature of cleaning or whether I should scrap it. I don't want to start annoying you, uh, the, the viewers out there, if I can help it. So, okay, on with the build of this watch. So I'm going to start really with, um, well, just telling you that I have already... Uh, done the dial shock here so I've cleaned that and oiled it I will demonstrate it on the balance later on and um, I've also uh, reassembled the uh, mainspring and barrel just to speed up the video just a little bit okay so we'll start off on the uh, microscope and we're just looking at the center jewel there and I always put a little bit of Mobius 9010 on the jewel like so and then we can fit the center wheel. So I'm going to try to do a little bit on the microscope here just because it makes it a bit easier. Because uh, again, now the center wheel's fitted, just going to try and get that into focus for you. I just tend to put a little bit again just on this top part. Just there. Because of course, that is where the um, bridge sits and I'll sort of just demonstrate that now to we'll try and fit the bridge yeah wasn't too sure then whether it was fitted so I do need to screw it in but again just for speed again I'm going to oil just a little tiny bit on this jewel here as well because that is where the fourth wheel will sit a little bit later on there we go testing testing okay so I've now secured it with the screw and I like to just check that the wheel moves nice and freely before carrying on so now I'm happy with that. It's the escape. And uh, by the way, uh, that is the dire fixed jewel on the other side. And I've just oiled that with my auto oiler. As I say before, there, I've got a video on how to remove those and clean them. And the only real way to oil them is using an auto oiler. So now I'm going to turn my attention to the barrel arbor where I have got some Mollycoat DX or I thought I'd got some Mollycoat DX and I like to just put a little bit of that actually in the hole itself and then we can drop the barrel in again just make sure it's binding for the center wheel uh, then it's a case of the uh, third wheel, which just drops in. Well, he says it just drops in. Normally does. There we go. Okay, then it's the fourth wheel. And the fourth wheel likes to have... I'm just trying to get hold of it. Always oh, quite hard to do on camera. Can't really get it, uh, but I need to put a little bit of Mobius. There's a little bump on it just there, and you put a bit of 9010, and then you can drop it down like so. So the next will be the train bridge. Here's the train bridge. Uh, despite being cleaned, it's still got some staining. You can kind of see the dial shock here. So I would be turning that over. I've already done it, I have to say. Here's the auto oiler, so version A1, which I've mentioned before. It's got like a little needle. Again, this isn't going to focus, is it? There's a little needle on the end. That goes in the hole, and you use this plunger to plunge up, and it sort of pushes the oil down and puts just a tiny drop in there but enough so with that we then need to fit it so 
So fitting the train bridge can sometimes be a bit of a fiddle. Uh, I like to just need my pegwood to help me guide it. I like to try and get it as close as possible to position. And there I'm way off. <laughs> And then once it's sort of lined up with the screws, I just rest my peg wood ever so slightly and try and coax the wheels in. There we go. So as you can see, they're all spinning. So at that point, keeping still a little bit of pressure on and I'm going to get some of the screws in while I can. Okay, now they're in. I tend to just like anything, tighten them all up uh, at the end. And again, we can just test that by moving the barrel, and they should be moving nice and freely. So, good job done so far. So, next is the click, and I sometimes wrestle with this. This little screw, uh, I tend to use a bit of pegwood just to try and keep the screw upright as best I can. They're either my best friend this screw or they're not and today it's sort of playing ball. Okay, so click is in position. Um, then use a bit of D5 Mobius. Before bringing in the ratchet wheel. Which as you can see, hopefully you can see, has got uh, a square hole and that's to locate it and secured of course with its screw little turn of the mainspring is enough to see the train runs so we are in business now so the next item to put on of course is the escape and I like to do that on the microscope so we can see the jewel there where the escape has to go and honestly with a microscope this makes this job so much easier I think I'm just slightly out of focus there um, trying to do this uh, with just a loop certainly as a beginner this used to be the uh, the one job of a watch that I absolutely hated, I, could, I, I remember I think spending probably an hour once trying to get this into position. There we go. So we're in. Okay, I've been trying to oil the uh, exit jewel on the pallet and uh, it's quite difficult for me to do on camera. Uh, with the light on, you don't get a good view, but I do. The bottom light is too overexposed no light is good so I'm going to try it again I've got a bent oiler that I've adapted and the idea is to get it in this hole and then just to touch as you can probably hopefully see there just putting a bit on that surface I don't know whether that came out or not um, and then you're supposed to let it run a little bit and then you can do it again so in order to do that, of course, I now need to fit the balance. So fitting the balance is usually the moment of truth. And I like to bring it in. Now I'm getting my eyes right low uh, because I'm trying to see the bottom pivot to get it in its jaw hole. And then I can turn it, drop it on its posts. And there we go. That's kind of how I do it. And of course, if you see it running like it is, then you can breathe a sigh of relief because at this point 
uh, it's only going to get better. I still remember the first time I took a watch. It was actually one of these movements. It was a 6119. And it took me days to take it apart and assemble it. And it didn't work beforehand. I didn't even clean it. I just took it apart, put it back together and put the balance in and the balance span. And I was ecstatic. And to be fair, I think it's that feeling now of taking something, a broken watch and fixing it that I am completely and utterly addicted to. So there we go. At the moment, that looks quite healthy. Uh, all I need to do now is oil the um, jewel, which I'll try and show you again on the microscope. And then we can put on the timograph, see if it's running OK before we continue with the calendar side. OK, we're looking at the uh, Dioshock jewel there and I've got it in a little container. There's the edge of the container just because I don't like doing this on the microscope. I normally do this on my bench but just to sort of illustrate the oil. So we are using Mobius 9010. And I will attempt to try and get some in there. So there is a right and a wrong way for these jewels. And it's like slightly dished, so you want the oil in the middle of the dish, so to speak. And I need a slightly different angle, I think. There we go. And let's just try and get that in focus for you. So kind of that sort of drop. And then I just need to turn the, uh, the sorry, it was knocking it now. So I'd need to turn this over and put it on top of that. Excuse the silence, but it's Quite a tricky manoeuvre. Uh, again, doing it on the microscope, that is. And I'm just using my best friend, Roddy Coat. Okay, so once I've got one corner in, I can start to manipulate the other prong. And for whatever reason, it doesn't want to play ball for me. There we go. Right, that's on and good. So while I'm on the microscope, we will oil the other jewels. And I've noticed now that the grime that didn't clean off uh, possibly could be scraped off. So that's a little bit uh, disconcerting to see that now. It proves that I should have inspected the parts a bit more. However, we'll just continue on Certainly right now, that might be something I return to later and clean again. So maybe it's 9010 again. I don't like to use too much. And I'm just trying to get my bearings now. There we are. And then we can flip it over and we can do the other side as well. Okay, on the uh, dial side, there will be a little bit of oiling and we don't do the escape. 
sorry the, the escape what am I talking about <laughs> we don't do the uh, pallet fork which is there but a little bit in that one and then I'm gonna because we'll be building this side now I will oil the necessary parts here as well so cannon pinion which is this thing I'd like to put a bit of d5 on the side it's quite a high friction point I also put a, just a drop the d5 on the jewel there I always think that helps with the uh, cannon pinion and the tightness or the looseness when you're trying to turn the hands I've just probably realized that you might be really out of focus so I do apologize for that and this is the um, where the minute wheel is going to go and I just put a little drop there and the little driving wheel transmission wheel I like to put a bit on that as well and then lastly where the calendar wheel is going to go okay there we are great okay we're on the time graph and uh, now it's kind of the moment of truth so I've set the lift angle uh, to 54.5 which is correct for one of these so let's get going and see what sort of readings we get so insulin we have a nice trace now there we go right so I'm just trying to see if that noise there might be me talking just turn down the uh, sensitivity so we've got minimal um, uh, rate problems there good amplitude at 224 234 now that it's jumped up uh, so anything over 200 on these old Seacos is brilliant and the beta error just needs a real minor uh, nudge just to bring those two lines together I can't tell whether there is some noise or whether that's just because I'm talking um, no it does look pretty clean doesn't it I suppose for the age of it I'm very impressed with that it's a lot better than it was already and it will be further tweaked so onwards and upwards we've got a good reading so far don't need to adjust anything too much I'll regulate it when it's in the case uh, so let's build the calendar okay starting the uh, calendar works always a bit of fun let's put the uh, clutch in first of all I then want a bit of the uh, Molly Coat DX, which I'm going to put into the setting lever hole there. This is always a prime place that seems to attract uh, rust. So I like to protect it as well as giving the setting lever its best chance uh, for good action. And then once we're happy with the setting lever, it's the yoke. And then setting lever spring. So the screws are in place, not completely tight yet because all I want to do is just need my glasses on. I've taken them off, I can't see. I just need to move the setting lever into position. So it's over that little lump there. And I also need to put some grease on those as well. So I've just greased just where that setting lever runs and now I can just drop in the stem oh, and I will at this point just put in that little drive wheel and I'm suffering because I haven't got the right magnification And I'm probably off camera as well 
Great. And now we have got something out of position here. Along with the movement, I was wanting to come out of the movement holder. As you can see, I don't rehearse a thing. So the stem's not going in. Uh, the setting lever, I think, has just uh, got a bit uh, stuck one moment. I was completely wrong. I just needed to push the uh, crown in a bit harder. Because now you can see that it's moving to its positions. So if you remember the long spring, it's the uh, same procedure. Get it into place. Drop the screw in. Once the screw's in, I just need my better tweezers. I can get that. I really haven't got this well in the uh, the holder. Nope. One moment again. That is the one thing that bugs me about the version 404 movement holder is sometimes it just doesn't grip when you want it to. And even now, after just messing with it, it's still trying to fight me. So I just want to bend that spring. I've let go. Um, too busy talking. It's now in position. And that is basically part of the mechanism here, which is all to do with the quick set. Onwards and upwards, we are going to fit the cannon pinion. And that will just drop on, push down, like so. Minute wheel, make sure it's binding with all of the gears. Calendar drive wheel. intermediate wheel our wheel I'm not happy with the hour wheel and then we can put the date fingers on And I'll put that anywhere. It's got one lump on it at one side. The other side's got two lumps. The two lumps go down, basically. So that's the uh, date driving finger. And then you put on this one, which is the... Sorry, this is the date. The other one's the day. Always get it mixed up. And basically, you try to put that lump between that V... Drop in the screw. It's a screw with a shoulder, this one, so it's I think it's the only one in this movement that's got a shoulder on it, so easily identifiable if you get your screws mixed up. Okay, and then I have that little uh, cover that keeps the mini wheel in place. Now, if you remember, it was missing a screw, and of course, I've gone and found one from a donut so we can continue on uh, and put in the um, this is the quick set for the uh, day wheel and it's just a lever it rests on there so when you push as you can see it stretches out like so so now we need the uh, click for the uh, date is going to go back on its post there. Uh, just hold it in place, pull the spring. Job done. I can now present the uh, date ring and I'm just going to secure it a little bit while I pull up the, the uh, click. Let the click take 
the uh, position and the pressure and then we can bring in the cover that keeps it all in place. Okay, the screws are now fitted and I've decided to go on to my other movement holder. Uh, losing my temper is not a good thing to be doing when you're building somebody else's watch. So we need to bring in, the well, we need to look at this spring here, okay, because there's a gear on the bottom and that gear is what that interferes with. So we place it on the top. I use an old oiler bit of pegwood hold it in place and then through this little access I can push that so it then takes position we can bring in the c-clip c-clip goes on the top it has a chamfered edge the chamfered edge goes down not up I always say that on my Seiko videos because if it goes up you can't uh, get anything underneath it to take it off if you need to service it again and there we have it those are now fitted so I just need to rebuild the automatic framework and we are good to go okay I've rebuilt the um, automatic framework it's a bit of a horrible job to do sometimes there's some tiny little screws and uh, I elected this time not to uh, do that as part of the video so with this this is held on by three small screws I like to get one in over here and then if I think it's in enough which I'm pretty confident I'll put a little bit of wind in the mainspring and it should sound like that which means that the pore levers are engaged if they're not it's under the microscope and give them a quick tweak so we'll just put these three screws in and then we're good to go fit in the dial and the hands right i found it through at 12 o'clock so the date has just changed and that means we can fit the hands like so and there we have it guys Hands are back on, watch is ticking, we know it's running all right. Now it's just time to put it in the case and give it its grand reveal. So, so far, I hope you've really enjoyed the rebuild of this. And hopefully at this point in time, this video isn't as long as all the others, who knows. So here we are on the time grapher and just going to start it. I've regulated it now, so let's see what readings we get. And as you can see, fairly straight line, just creeping a little bit, plus uh, five seconds or so. Beat error is perfect, amplitude is great, and of course this is in the dial up position. There we go, I'll just quickly turn it over to show you dial down. I know that's only two positions, but uh, it just goes to show that it's running absolutely bang on and lovely. Even I'm impressed uh, with this one. Fantastic. Okay guys, just a quick uh, summary. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry if there's been some sound issues during this video. I am testing a new microphone. It's like a shotgun microphone and it's causing me all kinds of grief because sometimes it records well and other times it records quiet. and. I'm not exactly great at video editing to sort out the sound. However, um, what do you guys think of uh, Ken's tank watch? I'm gonna call it a tank watch. I know I shouldn't. Um, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed it. 
Uh, there is evidence, actually, there was evidence in the in the back of the crown and all the surround in the case. It was really, really full of dirt. Now, of course, that does accumulate anyway, but I like to think that perhaps that was a bit of a bit of engine crap still loitering around after all this time. Equally, the dial, I've looked at the dial a bit closer on the microscope and um, it's difficult to say why it's, it's delaminating the way it is. Uh, it could be moisture ingress again from the gasket, but I still like to think that that was caused by the incident. It really would add a bit of charm and uh, to the story of this particular watch. I've dressed it with a nice uh, brown leather strap for Kent that I've bought. And typically with this watch, uh, like some Seikos, it is a 19mm lug, which is a real pain in the backside because there's not so much choice. So I bought a 20mm, sliced a little bit off the ends, just enough to squeeze it in and make it look pretty good. So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this video. Uh, it's uh, different, that's for certain, and uh, I do like the idea of doing a watch with a story. And perhaps I might see if I can find some more watches that have got stories and we can tell those. Uh, and also try and figure out a way to make some of my videos slightly shorter. Maybe not record every last bit that I do. It depends, you guys are the viewers, you consume what I put out. So if you guys enjoy it, please let me know that you like the long videos because I'm conscious that an hour or over an hour is far too long. So I would be interested to hear from you. Um, so with that, Ken, this will be finding its way to you very soon and I really do hope you like it. It's been an absolute pleasure to do this for you, sir. And uh, I'm sure that you're gonna get some years more usage out of that. And perhaps when it's back on your wrist, it'll take you back down memory lane to when you were a young lad. Um, how nice is that? So. Pleased to do that for you, mate. Uh, really, really good stuff. Uh, for everybody else, uh, more videos are coming soon. I have got an update coming on the Zodiac. Can you believe that? That watch has been on my bench for over six months. And now is the time to actually finish that video because we've got some wear on it. So stay tuned for that one. Uh, again, uh, check out my website. Check out the page for the tool links. If you want to support me, you can buy some tools on there and I get a little bit of kickback from that. Uh, also, please join the Facebook group, Retro and Vintage Watches and Restorations. There's a lot of us in there, all watch crazy, so come and join the fun, why not? Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell button so you're notified when I put more content on YouTube, and I will see you very soon in the next one. Hopefully a bit shorter video. Thanks, thanks a lot, bye for now.